Hey, this is the Lancer 20 Saturday Night. And I'm Evan. And today we're talking about vehicle combat again, the tactical rules this time. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of it, I just want to ask you all to subscribe and maybe share this with your friends and make sure to hit that notification bell. We could use all the help we can. Please, they're holding me hostage and they won't let me go. But with this video in vehicle combat, it's going to be more for if you have different combatants who some are using their Lamborghinis, some are in their Lamborghinis, and how to sort of suss out combat between those two. There's going to be a lot of terms that we've used to talk about in our previous video about vehicle combat. Go ahead and uh, click up there to look at that if you need a refresher course on that. So a few things about vehicle combat, like we said before, it's up on page 278 of the Starfinder Cool Rulebook. Um, now before we go too much further into this, I just want to clear a few things up with the basics. Your vehicles move on their own initiative in combat, and this is typically determined by the pilot's initiative check. Uh, vehicles are, do have a heading and direction. They need to be pointing at a, at a side on a square. And this is also going to be emanating from the center of the vehicle and about a 45 degree angle. So with all that in mind, it's a good idea to use miniatures and a grid map just for GM sanity and to be able to determine what vehicles are coming from where. That can be a lot to keep track of in just theater of the mind. Yeah, and especially, I don't know if you have friends who played Warhammer, just in the other video, fire their protractor and string because God damn, it's going to be useful. So similar to how regular combat works, there are going to be move actions, full actions, and swift actions that you can take. Some of the basic move actions you can take are boarding and disembarking from another vehicle. If the vehicles are moving, it is going to be an athletics check just to see if you fall off or not. You are going to take some damage if you do fail that check. One other thing to keep in mind when you are trying to start your vehicle, it is a move action to start your vehicle because you got to turn the key and do all that other crap. So bear that in mind if you are trying to make a quick getaway, maybe leave someone in the car with the the engine running and with the drive action like we mentioned in our previous video that's going to be the first the you know the smaller number in the vehicle stat block so use that when you are trying to drive again it's a 45 degree sort of thing in which you can move and you have to use a straight line when you are using each drive action at the end of it you can sort of turn your vehicle and also another thing to think of is that when you are moving unlike with regular combat you can't scrooge through the space of an ally or another object because you, know, you can't just scrooge through their vehicle. Like, no matter how much I wish you could just sort of scrooge through other other cars running around the freeway, it's not going to happen. All that's going to happen is your insurance rates are going to go up. And going into a few actions here, one of them is a stop short action. This is typically done after a race when you want to stop your vehicle before you slam into a wall or a bus or a cliff. Or a, or a cliff. To reduce this momentum, you would make a piloting check and reduce the amount of speed that you're continuing to go forward down to the nearest increment of five. Additionally, you can attempt to take control of an uncontrolled vehicle. This can be done in the case of, say, the pilot's dead or drunk or just bored of driving that day. Well, you would use your move action to take control of the vehicle, and that vehicle doesn't have any more or less uh, movement speed than it did on the pilot's turn, unless it's directed by terrain or any other circumstances. Say their foot was, say they're shot in the head and their foot gets lodged in the gas pedal, or say they're moving downhill, or say they're moving off a cliff. Once this is done, the vehicle's initiative becomes your initiative. This can be great if, say, you kill another driver and then I want to have two cars, GM, and I. Uh, Use the board action to send some of your boys over there? Yeah, exactly. Like in regular combat, you can take your full action. For example, you can take the race action. You're going to make a piloting check and the DC is going to be 10 plus your vehicle's level. If your vehicle, if you're trying to do the race action while your vehicle stopped, it is gonna be at a plus five, so it's gonna be a 10 plus five plus whatever your vehicle's level is. And if you succeed that piloting check, you're gonna be able to move at your full speed. If it is something where you do fail your piloting check from a dead stop, your your vehicle's not gonna move at all. It's like, you know, you flood the engine or, I don't know, car thing. Yeah, you stall out. Yeah, well, Lance says, because he's a smart boy, he knows about cars. But if you are um, already moving and you do fail your piloting check, there's going to be a couple different things that are going to happen based on the terrain. If you're on a bumpy terrain, your vehicle is going to start moving at half its speed. So let's say your movement speed was 20 and you fail your piloting check, you're going to keep moving in your current heading at a speed of 10. So kind of sucks, because I think most creatures are going to be able to sort of 
power walk past your car. <laughs> yeah. Or if you are on something like a flat surface for that sort of terrain, what's going to happen is you're going to kind of like fish tail out and you're, the DM's going to roll a dice and they're going to determine which sort of arc you're going to go into. The thing about the race action is that while you are, if you are blaring by someone, they do get an attack of opportunity, but also on the same token, you do get a plus two circumstantial bonus to your AC because you are zipping and zopping around at the speed of sound. After you are done taking your race action, there's a couple things you can do. You can either try to make another race, that you can decide if you want to make another race action next turn. So next turn you'll just make your pilot and check again, see if you can race or not. You can sort of slow down to a move speed. So if you've, you've caught up to someone and now you're sort of in range to start shooting at them, that's up to you. Another aspect of racing though is unsafe racing and this is going to be in a situation where you don't, you're racing somewhere where you really shouldn't be either. It's like it's too dark for you to see, maybe someone shot out your headlights or you're trying to take your vehicle into a terrain that it, that it can still go into but it wasn't meant to. Like if you're trying to take your Mazda Miata off-road that's going to be hard to do since, you know, the, the Miata is a good car, but it wasn't meant for going off in a random field. For that, the, the book doesn't have a set DC increase. It does recommend that your the piling check is going to be now a 20 plus your item level. But again, that's up to the GM's discretion. And so another full action you can take is the Ram action. And this is when you want to drive your vehicle up to its full speed and uh, kill somebody on the road. Why wouldn't you? You would be heading in a straight, you would be heading in a straight line from its current direction and heading, and you would try to ram a creature or object. At the end of movement, dealing twice the vehicle's collision damage to a target, and half to your vehicle. Just remember that this is all this is all determined and rolled up, and then you factor in your vehicle's hardness to reduce any damage brought to you. If you fail the piloting check to ram this creature, you still move wherever you are going to end up moving to, that being uh, the full speed, but you don't crash into the creature and you fail to ram them. But you also avoid damage to yourself, unless that full speed was to ram you into a wall, then sucks to be it. Another option that you can take if you want to hurt somebody with your vehicle and commit some vehicular manslaughter, scoring up, racking up those points, is taking the run over action. This would be done on a creature that is at most two sizes smaller than your vehicle. Say for example if you have a basic motorcycle with a size of large, you would be able to run over a creature that is a small or smaller entity, like a Yasaki or a gnome for example. Kid. Creatures hit take bludgeoning damage equal to the vehicle's collision damage, but each of them can attempt to make a reflex saving throw against the vehicle's collision DC. If you run over multiple creatures with this uh, run over action, you would take half of the total amount minus vehicle hardness. That sounds like a lot, but a really easy way to remember it. Say you run over three small creatures, dealing six damage to each, your vehicle would take nine damage because you just add it up and reduce it by half, and then you just minus your uh, vehicle's hardness which is found on the vehicle stat lock. And lastly, just like regular combats or whatever you can do, you can take a swift action with your turn. And these are certain things like turning off your autopilot, which is really good. It's like, kind of like your like the self-driving function on your car, where you can use a move action before. Maybe if you know when you're starting your journey to the Chick-fil-A, you can type in to your AI, to your autopilot that, hey, so we're going to the Chick-fil-A, so if I need to turn you on, it's going to head to the Chick-fil-A. How it's going to react, it, it's up to the DM. If it's more of like a stock AI, it's going to do things like obey traffic laws or not run into people, kind of like that one picture where someone trapped a, uh, a self-driving car in a circle of salt that they made look like do not uh, do not cross lanes. Um, but maybe if you have like more like a war machine or you've had a mechanic or some other tech nerd mess around with the AI, it'll maybe be okay with bowling into smaller vehicles or, I don't know, a park bench or whatever. Or something that won't really affect the vehicle's combo. Like say you have something like a, a tank or a refitted or a refitted police cruiser with a turret like a warthog on the back and you don't really care about running over traffic cones or signs because you're in a war zone sort of situation. And that's just a swift action turn on or off. Same thing with you have an auto drive which is like we talked in our previous video. It's basically a glorified cruise control where it just goes in the same heading and at the same speed. But let's say there's something where you aren't able to turn on your AI or your auto drive and your vehicle becomes uncontrolled. How 
uncontrolled vehicles work is they still move in the same heading, but they're gonna keep moving slower and slower. The book recommends three-fourths of the vehicle's original speed before it became uncontrolled until just sort of slowly rolling to a stop or until it hits something, you know, depending on what the DM says. And if you do crash into a vehicle, it is going to deal double your vehicle's damage to whatever you crash into. So for your action, let's say you're a pilot and you don't want to ram into someone, you can, or you're just a passenger, you can take an attack action. This can come in many different forms. Like let's say you're piloting the vehicle and you don't want to ram into someone and you have a really cool onboard computer thing like James Bond where maybe you have like a weird touch screen where it's like, shoot this. Or you have like a cool joystick on the steering wheel you can use to shoot that. Or if you have like a mounted turret on the vehicle, one of your passengers can, you know, take the gun and try to mow someone down like in the Warthog and Halo. Or if you're just a bunch of, you know, just good law-abiding citizens and you're, I don't know, being attacked by someone and only in self-defense, you can just uh, use your personal firearms to protect yourself. But regardless, if you are attacking through like a cool onboard shooting thing in your car or a turret or just shooting at your car, you are going to take the minus to attack that your vehicle is going to give you, so keep that in mind. And the next sort of attack you can do is a drive-by. It's when your vehicle is going into- Whoa, whoa, let me talk about drive-bys. Come on, who's more qualified here? So drive-by attacks are when a vehicle and its crew can go through a map uh, fast enough to clear the map, but while in the same while in the same area, they can make an attack. All those on the vehicle take the same attack penalty. Uh, typically, when you're doing a drive-by attack, the GM would determine how long it would take for you to get back onto the map or into that area to unleash another volley. The CRB recommends at least one round between drive-by attacks. And that makes sense, so you don't just have one overpower crew zipping and zopping and bebopping in and out shooting vehicles. And also, a round is about six seconds, and that's probably the amount of time it takes for you to rush through, turn around, and then rush back through again in an area. There's a few things to consider when making a drive-by attack. Making sure that you're hitting on a street that is running rival colors. You don't really have to make sure they have any collateral damage because, again, uh, other lives don't matter. Also, stealth doesn't seem like it to be something that should be taken into consideration at first glance, but it makes a lot of sense. Say, for example, you don't want to be rolling up on an area saying, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kill two piece because you know he stole my chain or he owes me crack money." You want to be rolling up kind of slow, like you're driving normally, just looking out the neighborhood, just making sure that you should be there. And then once you see this person, you would unleash on them, probably making a stealth check in advance. This could be against this, uh, this, the rival party's perception. Say, just so you're driving in, <clears throat> to make sure you're driving inconspicuously. If you're not, if you're just being a war boy, Mad Max style, with your flaming guitar up, fella in the back, and just chanting and screaming, well, then the rival gang could have some time to either take cover or duck into an alley or into the trap house, wherever they would go to make sure they don't catch no smoke. Lastly is escaping on a vehicle. Say you've completed your drive by and you're looking to go back into safe territory, or you just want to escape because a lot of your party members have been hurt during a very hostile vehicle chase. Typically vehicles can move at much greater speeds than say somebody on land and also have access to more maneuverability such as if a vehicle has a hover speed or a fly speed or if it can burrow underground or anything like that. Some things that other creatures like just a guy won't be able to do on their own. It is up to the GM to determine if somebody would have time to escape on their vehicle before attackers can unleash another volley. Typically if it's a vehicle versus land or you know pedestrians or anybody walking around uh, they would be able to get one more volley of fire in before escaping because cars are faster than people. What? I mean, except for Jamal. Jamal's fast. So that means that there are a few good parts to use vehicle combat in your game. I'd really recommend GMs keeping an eye out for using this if they do have one or more party members with ace pilot background that don't just want to be stuck on a starship or relegated to a starship combat forever. Now it doesn't sound fun, but say if they want to outplay their Akira fantasies or the Mad Max style thing that you're playing, anything like that. Or if they get a hit on the head and now they think they're a race car driver. Yeah, anything like that. It would be fun to change things up, especially for that player who spent a lot of money getting an intercycle or any sort of vehicle. It would 
put more useful incentives into it where, oh, okay, cool, you don't have to pay for bus fare now. Yeah, or maybe kind of like uh, we were talking about in our power armor video where you don't want to keep power your power armor so you, you don't have to walk to all the uh, adventures. If you have a car, you could use it to sort of haul that so it can be in your, your murder suit when it's time to, you know, murder someone good. Or it can also uh, give a little bit more flavor. Like, let's say for some reason you want to be like a neon knight and you know, joust from a vehicle. You could also, uh, you could also do that, which seems pretty cool. Yeah, also I find in a lot of my games, where a lot of big ticket items like say if your GM decides to buy a business in the area or a house or even a starship or a vehicle, they would be murder hobos left often because they would feel invested in whatever the heck they bought and really putting a lot of time into a vehicle or at least allowing options for it to have its own place in the game like vehicle combat can cut down a lot of murder hobo -ing. Yeah, it's sort of like a little camp even if it's like a big Winnebago, it's sort of like a home base, so it's not always, well, we're sleeping under a bridge, or we're sleeping at another inn. You yeah, know, it could be something for your mechanic to maintain, or your technomancer to try to put magic into, like yeah. a magic school bus, if you will. Golly. Yeah, but something sort of grounded, like you were saying, make it so they're not just wandering around being rascals. Um, to invest time into, um, you could also use this as a plot hook to, let's say, I don't know, the you want to upgrade, you know, some of the facilities on your big old Winnebago or just, you know, you want to make your, your race car so you can get around to places cooler. That can be a plot hook where instead of just, I'll give you a pile of credits and UBPs, it's, hey, so I'll give you, I don't know, a turbocharger. Oh, isn't that cool? That'd be pretty cool if you don't just want to pay them in money constantly so they have a big podcast, but no real direction to it. Yeah, I, I would give vehicle combat a, a, solid, a solid use. It's a lot easier than Star Trek combat by like a lot. And um, it seems pretty fun. It's a whole mini game inside of uh, Starfinder, but it makes sense for it to be there. It's easy to put in, but it's also easily avoidable, and it gives your player some investment. What do you think about it? Um, yeah, I, I like it overall. It's, it's a little bit more to learn it up front, but once you get your bearings, you can, you can really get on track, and I actually kind of like it. I, it's a it's if you, it's a way to give your your players something kind of valuable so they can get around. But if you don't trust them with a starship because they're gonna go wherever they want, you can you can give them a car and you can sort of keep them sort of at least on the planet and because you know unless they're gonna be stupid and try to make a jump into space, you can say, well, you all die, roll new character. Us salt bitches are gonna be in for today. Thanks again for watching 20 Sad Night. Please, for the love of God, so they can free me and my family, uh, subscribe, click the notification bell to get more video, to get more knowledge of when our videos come out. Thanks again for watching 20 Sad Night, and bye for now. Hey, I know we have a lot of fun here on the show, but uh, you know, I just wanna remind you guys to don't drink and drive. It's dangerous and you can get a really bad DUI. Uh, that covers my court sanctioned community service for uh, this uh, for this week. Thanks again for watching 20 Saturday Night and bye. Come and hear the song of Slanesh!